Stephanie is a senior lecturer and honorary consultant in hemo oncology at St Bart's Hospital London and he's an expert in the field of infection in immunocompromised patients with cancer. Okay so as uh, it says on the slides I'm a haematologist. I've been practicing at Bart's for many years now uh, and for much of that time actually uh, initially I was a, also a trustee of what was then CLL Support Association and not contributing very actively, so sensibly I stopped becoming a trustee and have been a medical advisor for many years. So the talk, uh, I will touch on current management of CLL, but in terms of and address issues around joint decision making. And it's fair to say that in management of chronic lymphocytic leukemia, there's been an absolute seismic change in the treatment options that exist. Uh, so that's clearly something I will be touching on. The other thing that's for me personally has been an equally huge change in the same time period, the last 10 to 15 years, is how I see my role as a doctor looking after people I see in the clinic. Obviously here we're talking specifically about chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So 10 to 15 years ago, I uh, was director of a stem cell uh, laboratory at St. Bartholomew's Hospital. I had a laboratory program looking at uh, new approaches to treat CLL uh, and I also saw patients in the clinic as well. And it would be fair to say that at that time uh, I was very focused on what I would call the modern medical approach uh, to healthcare. And that's basically uh, we make a pathological diagnosis. I'll explain why in CLL it's generally very simple to make the diagnosis generally uh, later on. But we make a pathological diagnosis and then as doctors we suggest the treatment for the disease that's been identified. It's a very scientific medical model which tends to not really include anything else going on as we just heard from John that we are all people, and you have CLL, you're still a person, and the modern medical model rather ignores that and focuses on the science and the treatment of the disease identified. And in fact, I hope it will come out in the wash during the next half hour, that everything else, uh, in terms of you as a person, is also incredibly important in dealing with the diagnosis, but also in terms of getting better. Okay, so I'll touch on what is CLL. So I'm, I'm really not entirely sure of uh, where everyone is in the audience in terms of CLL, if you've just been diagnosed, if you're very experienced. So I'll go back to basics, perhaps not basics in the same way as you may have been uh, introduced to it when you were diagnosed. I'll talk about treatment. I'm going to focus on first treatment for CLL because there that's becoming very uh, interesting because there are multiple options and also very complex. And in reality, treatments beyond first treatment, it's the same discussion and it's the same drugs at the moment. So I think we'll cover everything in that way. And I'll, I hope I'll touch on the important stuff from my perspective uh, as we go along. So the words, the words we use are very important uh, and chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So last week, two weeks ago actually, I was uh, having a consultation with uh, a lady newly diagnosed with CLL and at the end of the consultation, uh, she said she felt a little bit better about uh, her fear and anxiety that she was anticipating before the consultation. And she said, the thing that was bothering me most was the word chronic. And, and I was really pleased that she reminded me that some people will see that word as being a very negative word, and that gave me the opportunity to explain to her that that isn't necessarily what it means in the context of CLL. So, in fact, in the context of CLL, the word chronic implies not aggressive, and it implies it's something that you may have had for many years, and you may have for many years without any progression without any change or possibly slow progression. And by implication, it's not clear that treatment is required at the time of diagnosis. I'll come back to that. Uh, 
lymphocytic. Well, lymphocytic, a lymphocyte, is a type of white blood cell, and CLL is a disease of the white blood cells, a specific type of white blood cell called a B cell. And leukemia, oh, there you go, there's a picture of some lymphocytes in a blood film. Uh, I hope, uh, without me explaining, you are able to decide that what's a lymphocyte, but if not, uh, that's a lymphocyte. And all these sort of pale pinkish blobs are red cells. And the word leukemia, uh, directly translated from the Greek, means white blood because of the increase in the number of white blood cells. So the CLL cells circulate in the blood and hence the term leukemia, except when they don't circulate in the blood. And I had a conversation last week with another a newly diagnosed uh, patient with CLL. I've just used the word patient. I was trying to avoid using the word patient, so sorry about that. A newly diagnosed young man, 31 years old, uh, and he commented that he was a bit confused about what the diagnosis was because the term that had been used with him was small lymphocytic lymphoma. So when CLL presents as lumps and bumps and it's not present in the blood, you may hear this term used. They're exactly the same disease, and hence I much prefer referring to everything as CLL. Okay, at diagnosis, about 80% of newly diagnosed individuals it, it's done, it happens by chance. That's to say, we use, say, medically, an incidental finding. You may have had a blood count in the context of surgery that was coming along. You may have had an annual health check with the GP. The, the point, and the very important about, a point about this, is that individual had no idea that they were unwell, because they're not unwell. But then they're told something's not right. So when I uh, talk to doctors, to colleagues, to juniors about this, I, I really try and emphasize, keep it simple. At diagnosis, we can make the diagnosis almost always from the blood, and so there are lots of things we do not need at diagnosis in general. There are always exceptions, including a CT scan, a bone marrow test, a lymph node biopsy, and some of the older and newer, very fancy tests we can do are not strictly required at diagnosis. And I think that's about where the simplicity ends. And I think it's really, in, in fact, very, very challenging. And I've, I've used this phrase here, the doctor-person dichotomy, and I'll explain what I mean by that. So as a doctor about to see a patient newly diagnosed with CLL, I wonder what they're thinking, what are they feeling? And I suspect, in general, most of my colleagues feel relatively confident. I mean, after all, from our perspective, it's relatively straightforward. And we may have a sense we're about to give you some positive news. Now, this might sound ridiculous to you, but that may be our perception of it. You may not require treatment. I've just explained, most people, we do not offer treatment to a diagnosis. So that's got to be good news, hasn't it? Uh, and life can continue normally, uh, many years without treatment. Now, that uh, medical perspective, and I don't think it's just a medical perspective, I think it's a healthcare professional perspective. Uh, I wonder how you felt when you were going to that initial consultation, either because you knew what was wrong or you were about to find out. And I suspect it wasn't quite like uh, the medical perspective. And it may have felt something more like this, perhaps. For those of you not familiar with uh, this exhibition, you can look it up online, really amazing exhibition by Tracy Emin uh, of her experience of cancer, and which she's sort of, uh, exhibited in the way that she does in her profession. So... Uh, Work done by CLL support, work done in the literature, and work done by one of the speakers you're going to have in the afternoon, uh, have identified some of the issues that people with can uh, CLL report back. And a really key finding is this sense of being traumatized. People are traumatized by the words that are used. So I've already mentioned some of the words that we use without the explanation may have a very different impression 
on the people we're talking to than we think as doctors. Being told that your immune system is not as good as it ought to be may have profound implications for the way you lead your life. The good leukemia, watch and wait, uh, and then being told we're not going to do anything about it, or at least that can be the perception. Incurable. These are all aspects, possibly, of uh, the consultation, which are very unhelpful to most people. And people who have fed back, in, either in studies or in the work, as I've mentioned, to report that they're frightened, understandably. And they're frightened about, potentially, death, about the uncertainty of their future. As for in, in virtually every aspect. So this is the doctor-person dichotomy that I'm referring to. Uh, and people report that they feel confused and the information they're being given is counterintuitive. Am I ill or am I not ill? And uh, one person I thought expressed this very nicely that it wasn't clear that we have a shared reality with our doctors. So... If there's some things that... I, I'm not sure how much of that resonated with those of you in the audience, but I, I really would love to find out. You know, we have lots of time to discuss things uh, afterwards. So some of the things that have uh, been fed back... Uh, you get... I think people do get lots of written information when uh, they are diagnosed with uh, CLL, but getting more and better information. You'll see on the table in front of you... So... Pinky Jimenez talking to you this afternoon has got her own props, so I thought I'd bring some of my props as well. So you should find uh, on the table and in your packs some of the information that patients, at least at Bart's, should get when they're diagnosed. Now, there are num um, it's very pleasing for me to see a number of patients from Bart's here who have been under my care, so it's a great pleasure to see you all again. Uh, you may not all have got this at the start, but hopefully you will. So there's a form about free prescription if you haven't already uh, uh, been eligible for that, about vaccination. So at diagnosis, there's a vaccination schedule to be going through, and this was produced by CLL support with uh, UK CLL Forum. And at BART's, you will also get this. I've folded it up so you can see what it should look like, leaflet, uh, which is on the table as an A4 sheet with our contact details, your clinical nurse specialist details, and uh, their phone numbers, emails, and our 24-hour hotline. So that's what should happen, as well as all the other things on this line. But for the purposes of time, I'll push on. Uh, one other thing I want to mention, and I have to be frank, 10 to 15 years ago I wasn't doing this, and I am doing it now, and I suspect Clive, Pauline, and John will not recall me saying this to them when I first saw them, We've made the diagnosis from the blood test. We, we know what the diagnosis is. But after diagnosis, during follow-up, what we're interested in, in the, that blood test, is your bone marrow function. And once you've had a diagnosis made, we are not interested in the lymphocyte count. And it's such a frequent occurrence when I sit down in a consultation or it's a remote consultation, the individual will say to me, Dr. Agrawal or Samia, what was the blood count? Before I've had a chance to ask them, how are you? And, and then I pull, have to pull them back, tell them, well, let's just find out how you are first. And then when it comes to the blood count, remind them or explain to them, please do not focus on the lymphocyte count. The things to focus on is, is the CLL which is a disease that arises from the factory, and the factory is the bone marrow, making all of your blood cells, how is the factory operating? And if your haemoglobin is stable and or normal, and if your platelets are stable and or normal, the factory's working fine. And what the lymphocytes are doing does not guide us as to what the CLL is doing. So I hope that will be helpful to some people. Treatment and management. Okay. Now, I've taken this from a, a recent, uh, it may have been a health technology assessment, actually, by NICE, about initial treatment for CLL. And it's slightly complicated, 
but that's what it is. And I, the first thing I, I need to do to orientate you is I'm very pleased that NICE used the term people with CLL. So I think the things are changing, things are evolving. And there are two different sorts of people with CLL based on the biology of the CLL cells. And this refers to uh, an abnormality of a specific gene called TP53. And TP53 is a gene that's found on chromosome 17. So you can either have deletion of chromosome 17, or P. P refers to the short arm of... Chromosomes have long arms and short arms. And the short arm is P, and the long arm is Q. So you can have deletion of 17P, so you've lost that gene, TP53. Or the chromosome 17 might be there, but the TP53 gene is mutated. Either way, you fall into this category. The other option is you don't have that in your CLL cells. So it's one or the other. Now, not so long ago, that made a profound difference to the treatments that would have been discussed with you. Now, it doesn't make any difference. So it's a slightly uh, arbitrary split based on the treatment options available, which are shown here. Now, I'll go through these in detail in a second, but I just want to emphasise that NICE show exactly the same treatment options in both arms. Now, there's an arm in the middle, and I think I may have got rid of that arm for the purposes of time in this talk, uh, but I can address that if you think that's relevant to yourselves. It's, that middle arm is for people who are young and fit. I'm not defining young and fit. Okay. And you may not wish to be in that young and fit arm, if the treatment options there were the ones that are being offered, such as, we'll hear about this later, chemotherapy with immunotherapy, which is FCR, which would have been standard treatment not so long ago. Not so long ago. Okay, now, in order to understand treatment, first-line treatment for CLL, it's mainly, well, it's less applicable to treatment beyond first line, but still relevant. There are two bits of biology that we need to know. And interestingly, NICE didn't mention the second bit for some reason. So we've mentioned this. There's something wrong with the TP53 gene. Either it's not there or it's mutated. But there's another piece of information, and that's this, immunoglobulin heavy chain variable status. Now, I'm not going to say anything more about IGHV status other than your cells will either be mutated or unmutated. That's it. And from diagnosis, that's never going to change. So we can do this at diagnosis. It doesn't make any difference to the need for treatment. But it can have a possible impact on treatment choice. Now, this is actually something I'm not going into in great detail in this talk. It's complex. And uh, in reality... All of the treatment options available to you work regardless of these uh, differences. But I'm very happy to talk to people if they feel it's relevant to them after the talk. So if you... Oh, I have got it here. Have I? Oh, I have. I've kept it. So if you are in this middle group, so remember this middle group, you do not have... Uh, your TP53 gene is there and it's working as far as we know and you're young and fit, then you could be offered chemoimmunotherapy. Now, why on earth would you, in the current day, even consider this? And the reason might be because data now shows that some people in this scenario are cured of their CLL by FCR treatment. I guess I must be a bit older than I feel because I remember people that I've seen and treated for CLL before the era of FCR. And they received FC, so just chem chemotherapy with the two drugs who are cured. So I'll come back to words in a second. So the word incurable, in my opinion, is uh, inappropriate and unhelpful in the context of CLL. The reason you may not go for this is because of the toxicities of this treatment. Because the toxicities are greater, 
But I would just say one thing about toxicities, and that is, and about treatment in general. It's really a philosophical point, but uh, you do not know at the time you start a treatment, if there was a choice, that this treatment is the best treatment. It's not possible. No one, even your doctor, your consultant, cannot predict the future. So you make a choice, and we go with that choice, and we see what happens. So the relevance of that for current treatments, which are these three options, is that these are all extremely good options for your treating CLL. Which is best, I'll try and touch on. So what are the three options? So the first one is I'm going to mention is acalabrutinib. Uh, you have probably heard of BTK inhibitors, Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitors, of which acalabrutinib was the second licensed uh, drug. It's a tablet. You take it every day. Simple. Simple. Uh, venetoclax is not a BTK inhibitor. It's uh, another targeted uh, inhibitor, and it affects the ability of cells to survive. It, it hits a target called BCL2. And this is combined with uh, an infusion of binutuzumab, which is an antibody. So this is a bit more complex. It's, anti it's tablet and it's infusion. And then you've got a third iteration, recently available through NICE, which is venetoclax again, with ibrutinib. And ibrutinib is actually the first licensed BTK inhibitor. So it's very similar to a calibrutinib. So now you have a fully tablet option again, which combines two of the new therapies. So combining both the BTK inhibitor and venetoclax. So which is best? Really good question. Which is best? Okay. And in my opinion, and I do spend quite a lot of time talking to people at the time of treatment, is that it's what's most important to you. Uh, and there isn't a best option. They were all good options. So that's the way, that's my perspective, and that's how I present this. These are all good options. There's never going to be a good time to have uh, something wrong with you, including CLL, but the treatment landscape is definitely uh, better now than it was 10, 15 years ago, without a doubt in my opinion. So you might say, well, I'd like the best CLL response, please. And that's simple, isn't it? Yes, I would like that treatment, which is going to treat this disease the best uh, uh, possible. And I'm afraid it's not that simple, because there's a difference. You, you might say long-term disease control. So cure long-term disease control. Uh, the, these are terms that uh, are not different if, you, if your disease is controlled but present, is that better than it not being there at all? It, it, it's, it's not so obvious. So you can have long-term disease control with all of these treatments, but they are different. So venetoclax-based treatments will give you a very deep response. Now, are you all familiar with the term MRD? No. No, OK. Minimal residual disease. Since the advent of treatments such as FCR, so that's an old treatment now, we talk about minimal residual disease uh, being achieved. So when we look for CLL, we don't find it. And then when we look for CLL with sophisticated tests, we still don't find it. And that's called even minimal residual disease is not detectable. MRD negative. With venetoclax based regimens, there's a high rate of MRD negative complete responses. With the BTK based treatments, so if you're on the calibrutinib, that's much, much lower. But you get long term disease control with calibrutinib. So fundamentally different. But you're doing very well. Most people are well with both treatments. Another absolutely key difference, which may be very important to you, is the two venetoclax regimens I've presented to you are fixed duration. One is 12 months, you stop. One is 15 months, you stop. Versus a calibrutinib, which is continuous treatment until progression of disease and or side effects or intolerability of the drug. 
in my experience, people may be heavily influenced by what their consultant suggests. I do my best not to do that, and I present it to people, and usually people have a strong opinion of what they prefer. No, thank you, I'd like to have treatment and stop. No, thank you, I would like to be on a tablet for as long as I can be. Everyone has a different opinion on this. Toxicities, not really very relevant. They're all generally very well tolerated, but they do have different toxicities, and occasionally these toxicities may mean one of these options is not right for you, uh, particularly relating to the BTK inhibitors and heart disease. If you want a tablet-only treatment, obviously that will influence your choice. If you're happy to accept intravenous treatment being part of it, then obviously all of the options are available to you. Now, some things that may not be so obvious in treatment choice is the resources available. It may be your resources to attend the hospital uh, because some of the treatments are more intensive in the early phase than others, but also the resources of your hospital because many uh, institutions prefer one treatment over the other because of the challenges they have in delivering them. Uh, we're very lucky at Bart's that's never been the case, so I have at least been able to discuss all the options with the people that I see. I won't say anything about treatment sequencing other than some of these options will only be available as first-line treatment, whereas some of the others will still be available beyond first-line if you need treatment again. Okay, so I think really it does come down to the most practical issues for you that will determine treatment choice. And I come back to the point that they are all good treatments. How long have I been going on for? Sorry. I'm fine. I'm fine. So this is up here. One, as a reminder of, uh, of uh, a talk coming this afternoon. Uh, and I love, this is uh, from uh, Pinky Jimenez. This is on, I believe, uh, the website. Your diagnosis need not be a fight for survival, but the revival of your life. So that's a reminder to me as well to talk about what I feel uh, is the important stuff. So I've said a few words there, which so I've encapsulated uh, the modern, the current position with respect to CLL treatment. And you may have noticed that all of the three treatments have no chemotherapy in them. So we really are in a world of chemotherapy-free treatment, at least for chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So what else is there? Well, for me, the really important stuff, uh, and I'm not sure we do this very well at medical school, I'm not sure we do this very well in our medical life beyond medical school, is trust. So without trust uh, and uh, providing an environment for the people I see where they feel safe, there is some relationship between the individual and myself, for them to be able to say what they wish to say. It, it's far too easy to have a consultation uh, either in person or remotely. I don't think it makes any difference, actually. In fact, I have some personal experience that remote consultations allow an individual to be more open about what they say and what they wish to say, partly because of the stresses and strains of being in clinic. Certainly, our clinic, the clinic yesterday, like most of our clinics, was running very late. And one of the people I saw yesterday, she doesn't have hairy cell leukemia, but has a very similar disorder, it's a slightly more interesting name than hairy cell leukemia, actually. Than the CLL, sorry. She has hairy cell leukemia. It's a fantastic name for a disease. Uh, obviously, you don't want the disease, but it's a great name. <laughs> and she said to me, the thing that bothered her most about coming to clinic was it being in the waiting room. All those people coughing and spluttering and sneezing. So there are pros and cons about in-person and uh, remote, and I think a mixture of the two is probably the best way to follow people up. But if people don't have uh, trust in you, and if they don't feel comfortable and safe with you, you're not going to have a useful consultation. And it's my job to uh, make people feel that they are being listened to. So I can might look like I'm listening, but am I listening? And that I, I don't think we necessarily do that very well. Words. I've talked about words. I think words are incredibly important. 
10 to 15 years ago, I did what I thought was the right thing. So I would tell people that uh, I would talk about watch and wait 10 to 15 years ago. I don't anymore. In fact, I stopped doing that a long time ago. I would use the word incurable because I thought I was being honest and open, which I always am, with the people that I see. I, it's pointless telling people everything's going to be fine. You know, don't worry about it. You know, it's quite obvious to them that, well, there's something <laughs> not right here. You, know, you can't tell me that. Uh, and I've lost my train of thought there. Can someone remind me what I'm saying? Uh, the word incurable. Incurable, yes. Why do I dislike that word so much now? Because uh, I fundamentally changed my view about being open and honest. So being open and honest is absolutely essential, but we have to get it right. So taking away hope is an incredibly negative thing to do to someone. At the start, the very first consultation, I think that's incredibly unhelpful. I mentioned uh, the young man, newly diagnosed with SLL, which is really chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And uh, he said to me that probably the thing that bothered him most with the consultation with his consultant was he was told it was incurable. He's 31 years old. And he was thinking, well, what does that mean for me? my life, my wife, my children, etc. It's not true. So that's the first thing. Why would we say something to people that's not true? People are cured of CLL. I've given you some examples. I could give you more. We have an interesting patient case that I will talk about. And one of our patient speakers coming up, well... We can decide, is she cured, is she not cured? She looks pretty cured to me from here, <laughs> from here. So the words that we use are incredibly important. And then another thing I would not have thought of at all 10 to 15 years ago, and it's a word I hate, I still do not like this word, but it's so important, is empowerment. So, yes, it's a, it's a PC word, and I rather dislike it, but it does encapsulate what some of the things I feel are really important. That aspect of supporting people and encouraging them to be in charge of their life. Why on earth would you not be in charge of your life? You know, if you need to buy a new pair of shoes, you are going to decide what size they are, what colour they are, how much money you're going to spend, what's in fashion for you. For our daughter, the most important thing would be what's in fashion. It's your choice, and managing your CLL, how you live with CLL, is also your choice. I think John, at the start of the meeting, made a really good point. We are people with CLL, but first and foremost, you're a person. So for me, as a doctor, sitting in front of you, as someone with P CLL, I need to make sure I see the person. I do not see a patient, and even worse, I do not see a diagnosis. Because it's far too easy to say, this person has CLL. Do you have drenching night sweats? Are you getting high fevers when you don't have an infection? Have you lost a lot of weight unintentionally? Are you getting lots of infections? No? OK. Any lumps and bumps? No? That's fine. Done. I might examine you, but if you've told me there are no lumps and bumps and there were no lumps and bumps last time, it's generally a waste of time because you will know if you have a lump and bump that you didn't have. So after the examination, we finished. But what else is going on? Yesterday, I saw a gentleman with a new diagnosis of chronic lymphocytic leukemia and I have to be a little bit careful about what I say because I am making a huge amount of uh, judgment here. And one of the advice I give to our children is never judge. So anyway, I'm guilty of that here. This gentleman uh, was uh, referred to us in the context of management of another cancer. And as so frequently happens, he had a blood test. And the blood test, actually, no, he didn't have a blood test. He had a scan for follow-up of that cancer and the treatment of that cancer. The scan revealed he had some enlarged lymph nodes. They were biopsied. And 
it showed he had CLL. Everyone was surprised. He didn't know why he was in the clinic. It's always a challenge when people have been sent to you by medical oncology colleagues in the same hospital, and he's not quite sure why he's there. And yes, it is another cancer. Very rapidly, I realized that in this gentleman's life, this new diagnosis of CLL was a very uh, side issue. He had many other things that were really uh, of concern to him. Even his primary tumor was doing well. The graft that he'd had for the resection was for failing on his skin, so that was a major headache for him. He's significantly overweight. I'm not, not really touched on body and lifestyle, but all these things are incredibly important. When I examined him, the poor chap, he was unkempt, and his clothes smelt of urine. Quite obviously, this is not the most important thing in his life. So sometimes we need to look at the whole person. In fact, we need to look at the whole person all the time. So I regard this as being very important because if I, thank you, if I can encourage people to be in charge, to feel that they are in control and not me, I have no desire to be in control. I'm there to support and help. Then that gives them the best chance of doing the best they can do in their own lives in dealing with any treatment that they need and getting the best response to the treatment and keeping that response lasting for as long as possible. I've run over time. I apologise for that. But I hope we can make up five minutes for the tea break.